20 years ago, in the handheld gaming world, the Game Boy Advance reigned supreme. I was 14 at the time, and was just starting to take the first steps in my lifetime love affair with JRPGs. Sure, I had some experience in the past with JRPG-adjacent games like Link to the Past and Mega Man Battle Network, but it wasn't really until I played the first Golden Sun game on the GBA that I realized that I had a real appetite for strategy role-playing. So when Fire Emblem came to America for the first time in the form of the Blazing Blade, I was pretty much hooked immediately. Since then, I've played every US release, and while some entries are definitely better than others, Fire Emblem titles have always been a celebration of what's come before it. In 2022, when we got our first look at Engage, it definitely seemed, at least, like it would be a celebration of the last 20 years of tactical role-playing history. I began the journey documenting this game with cautious optimism. After all, Fire Emblem Three Houses set a high bar for the series, and since Engage came out only four years later, I wondered if this would be a rushed, slapped-together game. After all, Fire Emblem has a history of putting a lot of effort into a title, and then kinda half-assing it and reusing all the assets from the previous game for the next one. The Sacred Stones did this to the Blazing Blade, Radiant Dawn did this to Path of Radiance, and Fates did this to Awakening. Would Engage just be a recycled, not-as-good three houses? It was about time I found out. Oh god, why? The opening song for Engage is cringier than the dinner party episode of The Office. Hmm. That is sort of an oaky afterbirth. Mm. What was that? The thing though is that the song itself is not bad. A lot of the battle themes in the game are just symphonic versions of the opening song, and they're pretty good. It's just the lyrics and singing part that's abysmal. Direct Japanese to English word-for-word -word translations just don't work in music. But don't let the opening song scare you away, the game does get better. Fire Emblem Engage starts out in the midst of a heated battle between a bunch of anime heroes and big cannon fodder zombie things. Marth, the main character from the first Fire Emblem, mentions that this is the final battle. Marth and the Avatar unit charge headfirst into the final boss, the demonic looking question mark question mark question mark. Marth and the Avatar do their best Team Rocket impression. The time has come! Now, as one! Emblem! Engage! Yeah, that's right! How long do you think they spent rehearsing that beforehand? Well, it looks cool at least. So Marth and the Avatar fuse together into a brand new person, like some sort of less off-putting anamorph. And they strike a fatal blow on the three-eyed demon guy. He gives the typical, you'll never defeat me line, despite the fact that he's already been defeated. The Avatar, Lear, then wakes up, the whole thing seemingly some sort of a dream. I want to point out here, for clarification's sake moving forward, like in previous Fire Emblem games, you could choose between a male and female protagonist, depending on your preference, so since I chose the female, I'll be referring to Alir throughout the video accordingly. So anyways, Alir wakes up to the sight of two weird teens ogling her sleeping body. They let Alir know that she's the Divine Dragon, the significance of which isn't really clear yet. The Divine Dragon is finally awake! <laughs> hey, hold on! What are they, in a cult or something? Alir also meets Vander, an experienced knight character who, spoiler alert, the story completely forgets exists after about an hour. But it's not just the game that forgets Vander, Alir forgets him too because she has amnesia. Yep, the old JRPG amnesiac protagonist trope makes its shameless return, much like every season of SNL that still has Keenan Thompson in it. You've been on the show long enough, dude. Vander, along with the twins, Clan and Fram, which, by the way, are weird names, are the Divine Dragon's stewards, whose job is to wait for the Divine Dragon to wake up from her millennium-long slumber. They all decide to go visit Alir's mother, Lady Lumera, who is also a Divine Dragon. Vander explains that a thousand years ago, there was a war between Lumera and the fell dragon, Sombron, whom she defeated. On the way to Lethos Castle to see Lumera, the small party is attacked by undead creatures called the Corrupted. And that begins our first foray into combat. Now, I assume if you're still watching by this point in the video, you've probably played a Fire Emblem game before, but if you haven't, I'll be brief. The easiest way to describe the gameplay in Fire Emblem is that it's kind of like chess. You move your units across a board with the ultimate goal of taking down your enemy's units while trying to keep your own units safe. Each unit class and weapon type have their strengths and weaknesses, and victory often comes from developing a strategy around this. Like chess, it's easy to learn and impossible to master. Simple but complex is the heart of Fire Emblem's gameplay. 
and it's always a lot of fun to figure out different ways you could approach a problem and overcome it. Each entry in the series usually takes this basic formula and adds something new to it. Sometimes it's a gimmick, which that particular game centers around, and sometimes it's a mechanic that's so good it becomes permanently added to the core gameplay moving forward. For example, the marriage and child mechanic, in which you could romance certain units together to produce stronger child units, was first introduced in Genealogy of the Holy War. This mechanic was so good that it was adapted into Fire Emblem Awakening and made even better. It was then adapted further in Fire Emblem Fates, although in that game it was kind of shoehorned in as there was no story justification for it, but that's a different rant. The gimmick mechanic in this particular game is Emblem Rings. Emblem Rings are used to summon the spirits of legendary heroes who are the main characters of the previous Fire Emblem games. These emblems are one part RPG summon and one part power up. The emblems have their own special moves, but simply having their rings attached to a unit will give that unit a major stat upgrade, so their usefulness can't be overstated. I'll get more into the Emblem Rings gameplay later, but in short, Collecting and using these emblem rings will be a huge part of what this game is about, both in terms of combat and in the story. Anyways, the first battle acts as a tutorial to get you more familiar with the game's emblem mechanics, and afterwards, you meet your mother Lumera, who's a total... Mm, elf. Actually, I was gonna say dragon. Lumera could transform into a dragon at will, which is pretty sick, but also well-worn territory for Fire Emblem. Lumera is happy to see her daughter again. She mentions that Alir had been injured a thousand years ago, and her long sleep was to recover from her injury. The Divine Dragon still has a lot of questions, but at least that's one piece of the puzzle. Lumera then goes on to narrate a huge exposition dump, where she explains the world at large. They live in the continent of Elios, specifically in Lethos, the holy capital of the world. They're surrounded by four other nations, Farinae, the Kingdom of Abundance, Brodia, the Kingdom of Might, Elusia, Kingdom of Knowledge, and Solm, Queendom of Freedom. Say that five times fast. There's also Gradlon, the domain of the Fell Dragon, which is currently in ruin. I just want to point out that this tapestry art style, which is frequently used in the game, is just absolutely beautiful. I love it. Like certain Legend of Zelda games that did the same thing to great effect, the tapestry style really gives the feeling that Elios is rich in history and lore. I just love it. Lumera goes on to explain that a thousand years ago, the Fell Dragon waged war against all the other nations. The emblems were created to summon heroes from other worlds to fight and defeat Sombron. But much like Sauron in Lord of the Rings, a being that evil and powerful won't stay dead forever. This is probably a good time to cover what exactly the emblem heroes being in this game means for the continuity of the Fire Emblem series. For starters, Marth specifically introduces himself as Emblem Marth, indicating that the emblem heroes are not the original characters from the previous Fire Emblem games, but merely copies. They have identical personalities, but it's not really clear at what point in their own timelines they're from. To make things even more confusing, not all the Fire Emblem games are disconnected. Most are, but a few take place in the same universe. For example, the first Fire Emblem game takes place in Arcania, and 2,000 years later, it's renamed Elise, which is where Awakening takes place. Then there's the continent of Tellius, which is where Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn take place, but it's not the same universe as Arcania slash Elise. So for Marth and Lucina and Ike to be summoned via the emblems, that would mean that the emblems can summon heroes from both the past, the future, and across dimensions. So it's just magic, I guess. Vague, all-powerful magic. Don't think about it too hard. But the problem is, I do think about it too hard. In fact, I've lost a lot of sleep thinking about this. So we've already established that these emblems are just copies of the original, and despite existing in different universes and timelines, are still able to exist in the nexus of time and space, which is the world of Engage. Well, that's great and all, but what exactly are the heroes doing when they aren't summoned? Are they just chilling inside the rings like a genie in a lamp? Do they get bored? Do they need to use the bathroom? If they're copies of the original heroes, then shouldn't they desire to return to their own worlds and their own lives? It seems like they just live in purgatory, which is terribly depressing the more you think about it. But hey, we don't have time to give any more thought to this, and the writers of Fire Emblem Engage certainly didn't either, because any sort of clarity on the nature of these emblem rings is thoroughly disregarded moments after their introduction. Here we are. We are safe within these walls. That line seems a little on the nose, but I'm sure it is an ominous foreshadowing. I'm sure of it. Lumera takes Alir to the Ring Vault, where a handful of emblem rings are kept. She explains that there are 12 emblem rings in total, and because of their immense power, should never be kept in one place, lest they be stolen. The remaining rings, not kept in the ring vault, are scattered across the other realms of Elios. Side note I want to point out here, all the rooms in Lethos Castle are huge. I guess to accommodate Lumera when she's in her dragon form, 
Does every room in this castle need to be huge and empty so her giant dragon body can move around freely? How do all the human vassals get around? Does it just take them forever? Do they have to drive around in golf carts like they're on a movie set? That night, Lethos Castle is attacked by the Illusion Army, and Alir discovers they're being controlled by a mysterious hooded figure who's trying to steal the Emblem Rings. This enigmatic figure strikes Lumera with magic lightning before making her escape. Sadly, the Elder Dragon's wounds are too deep to heal. With her dying breaths, Lumera tasks her daughter with collecting the Twelve Emblem Rings before this mysterious enemy can. Despite not really remembering her mother, Alir still feels love for her and promises she'll make things right. The party meets Alfred, the Prince of Farinay, who is a friend of Lumera's. He offers to take them to Farinay so she could take their nation's Emblem Ring to aid Alir on her quest. So, with a clear goal to collect all twelve Emblem Rings and keep them safe from the clutches of the mysterious enemy who killed her mother, Alir and her allies begin their epic adventure. Before heading to Farinay, the player gets their first experience wandering around the Somniol, a floating sanctuary near Lethos Castle. This is where the Divine Dragon was sleeping originally, and it's a safe place for Alir and her allies. Rainbows all around me, there is no shame in my safe space. My safe space. Much like the Garrig Mock Monastery from Three Houses, it's your primary base of operations, offering plenty of stuff to do between chapters of the game. In my humble opinion, exploring Somniel is like half the fun of the game, so let's take a break from the story and talk about this floating sanctuary. The idea of having a home base isn't new to the Fire Emblem series. In fact, that gameplay mechanic goes as far back as Genealogy of the Holy War. However, a lot of subsequent games dropped the concept, and it wasn't really brought back until Fire Emblem Fates. As fun as the battles could be, it's nice to have a castle you could retreat to, tend to your wounds, and mix up the gameplay a bit before progressing forward in the story. Three Houses introduced the Garrick Mock Monastery, where the main hero spent a good chunk of time. That game really went balls to the wall with that mechanic, arguably to its own detriment. There's just so much to do at Garrick Mock that, when I think back on my time playing Three Houses, I think I probably spent more hours at the monastery than I did actually playing the storyline. In previous games, your home base served some strategic value, in that you could buy weapons and whatnot, but for the most part, it was just there for fluff, to buffer out the game's runtime. Three Houses turned your time spent at the monastery into its own strategic game that became required if you want to do well in the battles. You only had about 10 actions you could perform in one setting. Cooking meals, training in the arena, etc. all used points, so you had to think carefully and prioritize what you wanted to achieve most with your time. The gameplay in the Somniel isn't as detrimental as it is in Three Houses. You don't have students to recruit, so you won't necessarily be completely screwed later in the game if you don't maximize your time. There are some limits though, like you can only cook one meal and only train in the arena three times, for example, so how you spend your time does matter to some extent, it's just not as punishing as it is in Three Houses if you slack off. The Somniel finds a pretty good balance in this way. Several gameplay mechanics from Three Houses returns as well, such as cooking meals for your allies to increase support and unit stats. The Amiibo Gazebo returns, which allows you to unlock outfits for your characters, assuming you could get your hands on those sweet expensive-ass Fire Emblem figurines gifting items to your allies to increase your support levels, training matches between battles to gain experience, etc, etc. Honestly, as much as I liked Garrig Mach, it did get tedious running around that giant place. The Somniel is about one-third the size, which feels just right. And maybe I'm a bit biased, because while I did enjoy Garrig Mach's Harry Potter castle vibes, the Somniel just feels cozy. I'm a sucker for whimsical English cottage slash garden locations. In Three Houses, you had things like every character's room being identical, if it's just filler, why even include it? Fortunately, the Somniel has a lot more purposeful detail, with plants and other objects looking like they belong right where they are. Probably the most important area on the floating island is the Ring Chamber. Here you could inherit skills that you learned when you leveled up your bonds with Emblem Heroes. Each hero has a handful of skills that can be learned at the expense of SP, a value that is individual to each character. SP could be attained in battles, and it's not given liberally, meaning it could take a while to learn an inherited skill even after it's been unlocked. A lot of these skills are carryovers from previous games, and have the same effects. The skills could vary wildly between stat boosts, to special trap card-esque moves that may give you the upper hand in battle. My only gripe with the skill inheritance system is that you're limited to just two slots per character. This means that it really doesn't benefit a unit at all to increase their bond with more than two different emblem heroes. 
Once you've got your two moves, emblem bond levels for that character become redundant, and that happens just a little too fast. I normally say that it's not good to develop a relationship with somebody just so you could use them, but the emblem heroes are just begging to be used and discarded. I mean, this is literally the depth of their relationship with your units. It must be difficult for you to spend so much time around me and not develop feelings. I don't know what to say to that. Yeah, they aren't in it for the serious relationship either. They're like, please inherit my skills and then get the f out. I left some cab fare on the dresser. Also in the ring chamber, there's a mini game, if you could call it that, where to increase your bond with the emblem spirits, you need to periodically polish their rings so that they'll stay clean and shiny. You'll be given a cloth, and the more vigorous you wipe the ring, the more excited the emblem spirit will get. Yes! 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 Now, if you're familiar with the controversial petting mechanic in Fates, you'll see where Engage drew its inspiration from. I think somebody at Nintendo had to have a meeting with the Fire Emblem team, and they're like, guys, you killed it with three houses, can't wait for Engage to finish, but for the love of God, you can't do another groping minigame where you molest your party members with a stylus. It's creepy and off-putting, and we can't make that mistake again. Then somebody on the Fire Emblem team says, Switch doesn't even have a stylus, people could just use their finger for the groping. And then Nintendo's like, Mark, I think you're missing the point. As far as an actual mechanic goes, it's tedious as hell. I mean, who thought that polishing a ring would be a fun minigame? I mean, why not a painting the fence minigame? They also included a bond ring collectathon mechanic, where you could create lesser rings for each emblem spirit, with each ring featuring a character from that emblem spirit's original game. It's a cool way to reference characters that didn't make it into the main game, although it is a bit of a bloated feature, and feels like something that belongs on a gotcha-style phone game rather than a mainline entry. This kind of crap may fly on Fire Emblem Heroes, where standards go to die, but does it belong on a Switch game? This is the house that Breath of the Wild lives on, you show some respect and take your shoes off. I don't have much to say about the strength training minigame. It made my thumbs tired. After you first visit the Somniel, Alira and her party come across Flora Mill Town, a small village on the way to Illusia Castle. They see that the town is overrun by the corrupted, and that Alfred's sister, Princess Selene, is about to be attacked by the undead. Her royal retainers, Louise and Chloe, try their best to fend off the zombies so that Selene can make a run for it. There's a lot of recruitable units in this game, not unlike other Fire Emblem games, but because a lot of the story focuses on Alir and the Emblem heroes, the story unfortunately doesn't give a lot of time developing anyone else. As a result, a lot of recruits never make another appearance in the actual story or cutscenes after they're introduced. That being the case, I'm going to be brief when describing new recruits, which, you know what, is about as good as I could do anyways. Fire Emblem characters have always been known for having one-note traits and gimmicks, but Engage takes it to a whole new level of banality. As much as I like some of the characters in this game, it probably has some of the shallowest characters in recent Fire Emblem history. I'll get more into that later, but for now, hey, it's Louise. His whole thing is he's a pacifist. And here's Chloe, she's really into fairy tales. If you forgot that fact, don't worry, she'll remind you about a thousand more times throughout the game. Like a night out of a fairy tale, but the day I met you was the day I found myself living in a fairy tale instead. Maybe on the way, we'll see some nice landscapes right out of a fairy tale. So many lovely scenes straight out of a fairy tale. Fairy tale, fairy tale, fairy tale, fairy tale. I'm not trying to be negative, just being honest. There's good and bad things to this game, and character depth isn't one of those good things. And hey, while we're sidetracking from the story, I know what you're thinking. Chloe? Isn't it Chloe? A lot of the characters in this game have French-inspired names and unique pronunciations that my dumb American brain and speech impediment won't allow me to do justice to. Also, I kinda don't care. So to get this out of the way, let's go over all the characters whose names I will inevitably get wrong so you don't have to roast me in the comments section later. Sealing, Edie, Lupus, Hortensia, Mykia, Clan, Bunnet. If I mispronounce any of those characters' names, either now, in the past, or in the future, I apologize. Don't at me. Anyways, Alira and her companions intercept the corrupted and save Selene and her retainers from certain doom, but more of the undead are still lurking about. Selene offers up her emblem ring to Alir to help fight them. Alir uses the ring to summon Selica, who is one of the two protagonists from Fire Emblem Echoes, which was a remake of Fire Emblem Gaiden. Selica is a gentle soul and magic user who wears really short skirts. With her help, the party is able to clear the village of the corrupted. I feel like the battle in this village is when the game starts to really open up and show its potential. When I first played this chapter, I had a moment where I had to step back and think, wow, this game has improved so much from other Fire Emblem titles. 
The art style and the graphics are bright and beautiful. There's so much color in this game, and it's such a breath of fresh air after enduring the gritty, muted tones of Fates and Three Houses. I don't know if it was because of Genshin Impact or Breath of the Wild before it, but at some point in the last, like, five years or so, video games suddenly nailed that crisp anime style, and it works to great effect for Fire Emblem. Gage also really makes you realize kinda how ugly Three Houses looked by comparison. It's not just that Engage is an especially good-looking game, and it is, it's that Three Houses just looked really lackluster. Look at those dead eyes, staring off into nothing. Look at that low poly count. I know the Switch can't handle that much, but damn. I can honestly say I had no issue with the graphics when I first played Three Houses, but after playing Engage? Woof. The animations are so smooth and fluid, too. Look how these dodges and counterattacks bleed into each other. This actually looks like a real fight, as opposed to previous games where the characters kind of just stood there waiting to get attacked. And there's so much detail even in how the units interact with the map itself. During battle, fences and edifices, which are actually part of the map, can be damaged or destroyed. It's a cool detail, and what made me realize for the first time that the battle map and the overview map are one and the same. Speaking of maps, these have got to be some of the better maps I've seen in a Fire Emblem game in quite some time. In Three Houses, almost every map was basically just a big empty field, devoid of obstacles, points of interest, or environmental strategy. They were so bad and boring you'd think that they were randomly generated. In fact, I'd go as far as to say that the map design in Three Houses was the worst part about that game. I'll take it even a step further and say that I freaking hate the maps in Three Houses with a burning passion. Conversely, the Engage maps are varied, creative, feel tied to the location they're set in, and have more strategic value and overall are funner to play. P.S. I know it probably sounds like I'm taking a big steaming dump on Three Houses just to be mean, but don't get me wrong. I love Three Houses, hashtag Black Eagles for life. It's just that Engage, especially early in the game, shows off what areas it's superior in, and it's hard not to notice right away. Don't worry, by the end of the video I'll discuss all the things Three Houses did better. One really cool new feature is that after a battle, you could hang out and talk to your party members before moving on. The game doesn't take you back to the Somnial immediately. This adds some immersion that previous Fire Emblem titles never had. It's cool getting to battle in this small village, and then hang out afterwards and explore it on foot. It makes the location actually seem to matter and be fleshed out. You could even talk to the villagers, though they don't really have anything interesting to say. Most exciting of all, you could adopt kitty cats and take them back with you to the Somnial. This game's already paid for itself! Before heading out, you'll meet a mysterious girl named Vale, who becomes fast friends with Alir. Before they could talk further, she suddenly disappears. Strange. This mysterious girl is about the same size and has the same voice as the mysterious figure that killed Lumera. And she just happened to be in the same area around the same time and is showing a suspicious interest in Alir and her party. Hmm. It probably means nothing. Meanwhile, inside Faraday Castle, Alfred and Celine's mother, Queen Eve, is being held hostage by the illusions. This is the part where you tell me where you've got the ring stashed in here. <laughs> I'm not in the habit of speaking to lowly vermin. That's all that you are, the lot of you. Queen Eve is a badass bitch, and I really wish the game had spent more time with her. We soon discover that leading this enemy army is Zephia, a mysterious foe who is working with Lumera's killer two chapters back. Zephia is a main character, so unlike minor characters who only have one character trait, Zephia has two traits. Big tits is mean. Now you know everything you need to know about her. Zephia is after the emblems and threatens to kill everyone in the castle if Eve doesn't play ball. Fortunately for her, Alir and her party come just in time to save the day. The queen lets Alir know that the nation of Faranay has not one, but two emblems, and that the second is hidden at a shrine on the border of the neighboring nation of Brodia. The queen gives her children her blessing to accompany the divine dragon, and with that, the party is off towards Brodia. After a thousand years, the fell dragon reawakens. Now, you must journey across four different kingdoms. and collect the 12 emblem rings before Elios descends into flame. Fire Emblem Engage. Summon your destiny on January 20th.
Fire Emblem Engage will have you traveling from area to area via a world map. I gotta say, I'm in love with this map. I'm a big, big fan of world maps and RPGs. I think they're so aesthetically pleasing and can serve the great purpose of adding depth and scope to the fictional world you get to play in. I love that it's in 3D and not just a 2D top-down map. There's a lot of detail in each area, but it's still simple and condensed enough for you to move about quickly. It's perfect. Chef's kiss emoji. It's about this time when paralogues begin to pop up on the map. Paralogues are bonus chapters that have been a staple in the Fire Emblem series for quite a while. A few of them will allow you to recruit new characters, like this cockney little street urchin named Jean. Lisa, I want some more. And this other small child named Anna, who's appeared in all the other Fire Emblem games so far in different incarnations. She's basically Kang the Conqueror, traveling across the multiverse to rule all existence, and also, she's here to sell you her wares at deep, deep discounts. Most of the paralogues, though, are centered around the theme of the Emblem Heroes. Lucina's map, for example, is designed to look like Arena Faro, an infamous map from Fire Emblem Awakening. Korin's map is meant to resemble the battlefield at the start of Fates, where she had to decide whether she would side with Hoshido or Nor. But I'm probably getting ahead of myself, since these Emblem heroes haven't even been introduced yet. Just thought I'd mention it. I think this theme works really great for the paralogues. It's really cool getting to replay some of my favorite maps from previous Fire Emblem games. On the way to Brodia, Alira and her party run into a quirky thief named Yunaka, who's really trying to get her catchphrase to launch off. Hiya papaya! Hiya papaya? Hiya? Yunaka stole Faranay's second emblem from the shrine, but she has a change of heart and asks Alira for her forgiveness. The emblem in question, who takes the form of Mykia from Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn, vouches for Yunaka. Her apologies aren't good enough for Alir, however, as the Divine Dragon requires a sacrifice of blood. No, I'm kidding. Alir and her friends accept the thief with open arms into their party. The group continues next to Brodia to see if their royal family would be just as accommodating of their quest as the royal family of Faranay had been. They're stopped at the border by what appears to be three marauders, one of which almost hits Alir with an arrow. When Alir introduces herself, the archer feels deep remorse for the misunderstanding and prostates himself in a pretty hilarious way. He introduces himself as Alchrist, a prince of Brodia, and younger brother to Diamond, who's the heir to the throne. This is when you'll also meet his two retainers, Lapis and Citrine, who, FYI, are my two favorite characters in the game. I think one of the great things about Fire Emblem is that with all the characters, everyone has their favorite. In a similar vein, a lot of Fire Emblem players will have a specific crush for each game, and for me, Citrine is top-tier crush material. You know what? Let's take a slight detour from the story to talk about my favorite Fire Emblem crushes, because of course you're interested to hear about that. Coming in at number 3, Lythe from Path of Radiance. Lythe reminds me a lot of my actual wife in a lot of ways. She's sharp-witted and even sharper-tongued. Unlike my wife, however, she is a cat person. My second place crush is Scarlet from Fire Emblem Fates. Scarlet is a badass that doesn't take any crap from anybody. Are you starting to see a theme here? Despite her story ending tragically, it is possible to marry her, though that marriage only lasts one chapter before her untimely demise. I'm still holding out hope that if Fates is ever remade, there will be a path where Scarlet lives. And my number one Fire Emblem crush, Lucina from Fire Emblem Awakening. Lucina is independent, strong, and just my type. Also, depending on the path you choose, you could either be her husband or her dad. And who doesn't like having options, right? For those not familiar with the Awakening story, don't worry. This is a time travel thing, not an Alabama thing. Anyways, back to the actual game I'm supposed to be talking about. Alchrist, Citrine, and Lapis join the party, but on their way to Brodia Castle, their path is blocked by Hortensia, a princess from Illusia. Illusia and Brodia have an unfriendly history, being at war with each other for years. There's a conversation here that has a hint of nuance to it, but if you think the greater backstory to the two nations' histories is going to be dug into at any point, to the same extent that Three Houses handled its geopolitical history, you're in for a disappointment. With Hortensia blocking the path, the only way to Brodia is through her. For the first time in the game, we're introduced to an enemy wielding an emblem hero themselves. This changes things up a bit. Up until now, the player had been a bit overpowered, so it becomes a bit more challenging at this point moving forward now that the playing field is evened out a little bit more. Hortensia is controlling my top girl Lucina from Awakening. An interesting thing to note here is that when the enemies are controlling emblem rings, the heroes kind of just act like mindless zombies, without retaining any of their personality. It's basically the end of Aladdin, when Jafar takes control of the magic lamp and forces Genie to attack Aladdin. Same general idea, with the emblem heroes being obligated to obey whoever wears the ring. Anyways, the Illusion Princess is no match for our heroes, and she and her retainers flee, clearing the path for Brodia Castle. Here we meet the Crown Prince Diamant, 
who has an unnecessarily stylish, flamboyant, and Gatsby-esque introduction. I've been waiting for you, Divine One. I greet you as the Crown Prince of Brodia. I'm Diamant. We get it, you're a cool dude. Alchrist introduces his brother to Alir in the party, and informs him that Illusion forces are at Brodia's door. This is the point where the story really starts to escalate, and you realize that the pursuit of the Emblem Rings is already leading to full-blown war between nations. This is also when you meet King Morion, an amiable, tough old son of a bitch who loves nothing more than wrestling and saluting his flag, and also his sons. He's a real patriot and hot dad. Morian hands over their nation's emblem ring to Alir to help in their upcoming battle. It's Roy, the young lion from the Blazing Blade, and top-tier Smash Brothers fighter. Leading the Illusion army is Ivy, older sister of Hortensia, and heir to the Illusion throne. Ivy is after the emblem rings, go figure, and she talks some shit to the Brodian royal family before going back to join her army. Ivy acts tough, but we come to realize she's really just performing her father's bidding. Her father, King Hyacinth of Illusia, is really the one behind the invasion of Brodia Castle, and Ivy and Hortensia tragically are just going along with it to please their father, who, spoiler alert, will never be pleased, because that's how dads actually are in real life. Yes, I'm still doing YouTube videos, dad. At the start of the battle, you'll gain a new recruit, Amber, a friend of Diamond, who arrives just in time to aid your team. I never used Amber, so I don't really know what his deal is. All I know is that Amber is the color of your energy. Is this thing on? Anyways, Alir aids Brodia against the Illusion army and defends the castle from complete destruction, pushing the Illusions to retreat. Ivy loses the battle, and her emblem, Leaf, the brave prince from Thrasia 776. Alir yoinks that ring, adding it to her ever-growing collection. Afterwards, King Morian is called out to a one-on-one -on -one duel by King Hyacinth. Despite the fact that the Illusion King has already lost, and King Morian really has nothing to gain here, he still accepts the challenge anyways because... why? I mean, obviously he's gonna kill you, dude. You're the expendable, likable father figure who already has the successor in place. You're storyline cannon fodder. Just stay in the castle where it's safe. But hey, you know what? That's not Morian style. So after a conversation with the sons that reeks of, this is the last conversation they'll ever have, the lovable oaf goes outside to face his destiny. Sure enough, after an epic duel, Hyacinth comes out on top. What's really offensive here is that he uses Emblem Lin from the Blazing Blade to finish him off. Lin is the first playable character in a Western release Fire Emblem game ever. She's essentially a lot of Fire Emblem fans' first protagonist, and so she holds a bit of a sacred spot in our hearts as a symbol of strength and heroism. Seeing the first Emblem kill of the game, coming from Lin of all people, is a real punch to the gut. It'd be like discovering that, after all these years, that drunk driver that killed your parents was Mickey Mouse. Haha! <laughs> it was a one-time mistake that I'll have to live with for the rest of my life! Isn't that punishment enough, Your Honor? Ha <laughs> ha! The next chapter has your army going up against Ivy again. Under orders from her father, she's to retrieve the stolen emblem leaf. Now, just a reminder, she just lost to Alir with an emblem ring, so this time around, she's pretty much bound to lose, right? The reality that her father sent her off to her death gradually dawns on her. She tells her retainers, the weirdly mysterious Zelkov and the amiable Kagetsu, that if they want to run away, they can. Even though she was the boss of the previous chapter, it's hard not to have your heart soften for her a bit when you see the position she's been put in. But her retainers are loyal to her, and they vow to die by her side. Alir fights Ivy again, and defeats her again. The Illusion Princess's plight is not lost on the Divine Dragon, who takes pity on her, and offers to take her in rather than to kill her. In exchange, Ivy informs them of her father's actions, namely to sacrifice Morian as part of a dark ritual to restore the Fell Dragon's power. The Brodian princes aren't keen to trust Ivy, but they have no choice but to believe her. She joins your party, and everyone rushes off to Destinia Cathedral to save Morian and to stop the Fell Dragon's return. Things are getting a little heavy with the story, so let's go back to the Somnial, where only fun and laughs could be had, and also you could dress as provocative as you want, because nobody is there to judge you. Those are mainland problems, you're on a floating island now, baby. By this point in the game, you've probably accrued a fair number of bonds between your units. Fire Emblem's famous support system is back, same as it ever was. Having two units fight next to each other will gradually increase their bond, which leads to support conversations between them being progressively unlocked. 
Three Houses added the feature of gifting items to your units. If you know that a certain character likes a certain thing, like flowers or a book or something, giving them that item will increase your bond levels even further. You could also gift horse manure to your allies if you really hate them. You could find it mostly around the stables, which makes sense, but you could also find it pretty much everywhere around Somniol. Dad, why is that in the kitchen? The horse manure doesn't serve any strategic value, but it does lead to some pretty great dialogue. In three houses, your bond level was more important than it ever was before. Getting a high enough bond with certain units would convince them to abandon their house and join yours. This allowed freedom to attain pretty much any unit despite which house you chose, and those choices also majorly affected the storyline. Unfortunately, there isn't much purpose to the support system this time around. Engage doesn't reward or punish you for not increasing your unit-to-unit -unit bond, instead putting a lot more emphasis on your bonds with the emblems. This isn't a deal breaker, it's just a step backwards. I mean, in previous titles, the conversations themselves were incentive enough. Unfortunately, a lot of Engage's supports are just... bad. We'll visit all the tea farms in the world. And we can pass the time taking in beautiful landscapes while sipping delicious tea. Wonderful idea, Chloe. The thing that makes supports interesting is that they basically function as additional reading. They go more into depth on the characters' backstories, covering things the main storyline doesn't have time for. And honestly, when your party has like 30 units in it, character development is bound to slip through the cracks. So if you really want to dig into a certain character, you can, but you have to work for it. But because Engage's main storyline is so thin and flimsy, it doesn't allow much further depth for the support conversations. The characters themselves are kind of thin and flimsy too. The only supports that actually do matter, gameplay-wise, is the support between Alir and whoever S-ranked her, if you know what I mean. At the end of the game, whoever has the highest relationship with your avatar will marry her. This leads to a short cutscene, and that's about it. The marriage system, like three houses before it, has been majorly truncated from the highs we saw in Awakening and Fates. As someone who is a lover of love, the romance slash dating simulator from those 3DS games was one of my favorite features. Any single unit could marry any single unit, and each had their own romantic plotline that both made sense thematically and was cute as hell. I mean, just listen to this music from Awakening and tell me it doesn't make you want to go shout your love from a rooftop. In Three Houses, there simply was no romance mechanic because the game focused on the protagonist, a teacher, and the majority of the cast, the underage students. So yes, I get it. We wouldn't want a Fire Emblem Mary Kay Letourneau edition. But still, it was disappointing to not have that feature. In Engage, there is no conflict of interest. You are an old-ass divine dragon and most of your battle party are of age and not your students. So why is there no romance between units? Why did that feature get taken out? Well, technically, the marriage system in previous games worked towards a certain end. That is, creating offspring that could inherit your bonded unit's best attributes. Since there's none of that in Engage, I guess it makes sense to not include the romance mechanic, but whatever. I guess I'll just have to romantic fanfiction certain units together myself, like some sort of peasant. Actually, now that I think of it, the bond mechanic between your unit and an emblem character is the marriage mechanic. Your unit accepts a ring, bonds with the emblem, oh. and a new merged being is created. Also, for whatever reason, Engage's support levels just take forever to attain compared to previous games. By the end of a casual playthrough, I think I unlocked maybe a dozen supports. I don't mind working towards something, but you've got to make the goal a little more rewarding, you know? I don't treat people differently just because they're cute. Kindness matters much more. Wrong! Being nice is great and all, but cuteness is a huge advantage. This conversation is seriously my reward? While we're at the Somnial, let's talk about a few features I didn't cover earlier. After about chapter 10 or so, you'll unlock a Wyvern flying minigame, which is exactly what it sounds like. You ride a mini dragon around the skies above the Somnial, shooting at targets and trying to get the highest score you can before the timer ends. It reminds me a lot of the gummy ship levels from the Kingdom Hearts games, and by that I mean it's fun once and then I never want to play it again. If you go to this little building tucked away in the corner, you'll gain access to the photo shoot mode. Here you can set up whatever units you have in different positions in front of different backdrops. I love photo modes in video games, so I spent a lot of time on this. When you snap a photo, you could use it to make a custom display card for your online profile. Speaking of online stuff, at the very edge of the Somnial is an ominous looking building called the Tower of Trials. Here you can play a variety of online matches, and there's a surprising amount of variety here. You can do a gauntlet type trial that challenges you to go through three maps in a row, 
You could do a relay challenge where different online users take turns playing a battle, and there's even a mode that lets you create your own battle maps. As a long-term Fire Emblem fan, this isn't something I ever knew I needed, and it does not disappoint. About halfway through the game, you'll unlock a flea market, which is always manned by a random unit. Here you can buy random items, mostly the giftable items used to enhance your bond with your units. I mentioned a while ago that you could adopt cats. Well, there's actually a lot of different animals you could adopt. They could be found in the post-battle areas where you wander around the map talking to allies. Adopting animals is a really easy way to farm resources like milk, eggs, and other items. Some animals, like camels, can only be adopted if you've donated enough money to certain countries. Hey, you scratch my back, buddy. I'll scratch yours. Before you ever get a chance to adopt animals, however, you'll find that the Somniol already has a furry resident in the form of Somi, who's kind of like a dog or something. He reminds me a lot of the Sailor Moon cat, as he's basically just a mascot for the game. Petting and feeding him will net you a small amount of bond fragments as a reward, though the game makes no hint as to what sort of food he likes or doesn't like, so it's kind of a crapshoot. I've just been giving him potatoes, and he seems kind of ambivalent about it. He hasn't died yet, which I consider a win. Once your bond is high enough, this little furry friend will follow you around, giving you slight help in the strength training and fishing minigames. You could also dress him up in sunglasses or give him an Allure wig, which is pretty funny. Personally, I really don't like Sami following me around, or anyone for that matter. It follows, I find really scary for this reason, so when I hear the pitter-patter of his little feet off in the distance, it stresses me out beyond belief. Ugh. Get away from me, little gremlin. Probably the strangest of all the Somnial inclusions are the wake-up events. On the top floor of the main building is Alira's bedroom, where you can choose to take a nap. Taking a nap will change the time of day at the Somnial from night to day or vice versa, which changes a few things aesthetically, and opens up the fortune teller booth that's only available at night. When you wake up, it triggers a scene where one of the characters is hovering over Alira, watching her sleep. I have to imagine that guy from the Fire Emblem development team had a meeting with Nintendo and said, Look, I know you don't want another groping minigame. I hear you. I respect your stance on that. I really do. But, and just hear me out, how about a minigame where all your units stand over Alir's bedside and watch her while she's sleeping? Well, I think we spent enough time at the Somnial. Let's get back into the story. Alir and her party rush into the Destinia Cathedral up in the snowy Brodian Mountains. Sadly, they find that they were too late to stop Hyacinth from performing his evil ritual. Sombron has drained the life essence out of King Morion, turning him into just another corrupted. Diamant and Alchrist are devastated to see this happen to their father, but resolve to put him out of his misery. After an intense battle, our heroes defeat Hyacinth and Morion, but Alir and her party are too late to stop Sombron's resurrection. Hyacinth is pleased with his work, but in typical Demon Summoner fashion, just now realizes that creating a monster might be dangerous for himself as well. So sure enough, Sombron scarfs up a tasty meal of Loyal Servant, which is like, come on, what an unappreciative demonic serpent king. While everyone's distracted by that, the mysterious woman that killed Alir's mother reveals herself to be none other than Vale, to the surprise and shock of, like, nobody paying even the slightest amount of attention. We also find out that she is Sombron's daughter, and was pulling the strings behind Hyacinth. She's also the leader of the Four Hounds, a cult devoted to resurrecting the Demon King. They are Zephia, who we've discussed already, Gris. His whole thing is that he's a masochist, which is a pretty adult concept for a Nintendo game. Honestly, he's kind of hilarious. Mavier, a silent and stoic man who almost certainly will change sides by the end of the story. And then there's Marnie, your typical sociopathic schoolgirl, normally only found in animes and Tarantino movies. She loves killing people, and she's always late to AP Calculus, typical teen. So Vale and the Four Hounds steal the hero's emblem rings, turning Marth into Evil Marth, Roy into Evil Roy, and Leaf into Evil Roy with a slightly different outfit. Severely outnumbered, Alir and the company decide the only path forward is to retreat. This kicks up Chapter 11, which is an interesting point in the game, as it's the first time the game actually is... kinda difficult? Engage actually does a good job of tricking the player into thinking that they'll be overpowered for the whole game. In reality, the first 10 chapters are just a warm-up to get you familiar with the emblems. But, spoiler alert, it'll be a long time before you get those emblems back, and you'll have to make do with what you have moving forward. I actually really liked this decision, gameplay-wise. Engage makes sure you've absolutely gone the emblem mechanics down before taking it all away and ramping the difficulty way up. It's a welcome challenge. In Chapter 11, the goal is to get a leer to the edge of the map so the party can escape. You'll be chased by the Corrupted, Vale, Two Fat Lizards, and the Four Hounds. 
The stolen emblem rings are divvied up between all the enemies, including the Corrupted, and once one of them is defeated, the emblem then goes to a different enemy, which keeps the challenge level high throughout. The only way to defeat all the emblem rings is to defeat every last enemy unit, which is ill-advised because the enemies in this stage are very overpowered. Now, if you've played a Fire Emblem game before, you'll know that half the fun is breaking the game, so to speak. Fire Emblem often dangles carrots in front of the player, presenting challenges that you're not supposed to overcome, but still gives you the means to overcome them. So you better believe that when the game is telling me you need to run, you can't beat these enemies, that I'm going to spend an ungodly amount of time replaying this level until I wipe out every single enemy. And good news, it's possible. It's very, very hard though, especially when the four hounds show up, each using an emblem ring that amplifies their special skills. Gris, for example, will use Celica's teleport move to close the gap between you and go in for the kill. It makes isolating your enemies and keeping your weaker units out of range pretty difficult, but if you take advantage of the woods, you could avoid enough attacks to survive and conquer. I'm sad to say that Bale herself is programmed to be invincible here, so even if you do land a blow on her, it's impossible to beat her. Oh well. It was still worth it to say, I didn't run away, I'm a man. A big strong man that can't manage to beat up this little girl. This is basically the all is lost moment in the story. Our heroes are feeling pretty bad by now. Diamant and Alcris lost their father. Ivy lost her father too, technically, even though he's kind of a jerk, what with the resurrecting Satan and all. Alir had all of her emblem friends taken away from her and turned into evil zombies. And the rando little girl she was starting to befriend? Well, turns out she killed Alir's mom. Not a great day. Moving past that, our heroes move south towards the sandy country of Solm to seek out their emblems before Vale and the others can get there first. But like the Jews in Egypt, our party ends up wandering around, hopelessly lost in the desert. Commandment number four, when we pass a billboard, please don't read it out loud, all right? Now come on, let's get going. Ooh, look at that, Danny Gans, Entertainer of the Year. What did I say? They're approached by a wandering nomad named Fogato. Fogato is a swarthy young man who, well, he's a real curiosity to me. His voice acting actually kind of sounds natural, which in a game full of bad voice acting doesn't quite fit right. Anyways, Fogato, despite never actually flirting or hitting on anyone in the main storyline, definitely has an air of cocky playboy to him. Alir introduces herself as the Divine Dragon, which, by the way, she loves telling people every chance she gets. At this point in the story, the entire nation of Illusia, and who knows how many others, are trying to kill her. How about a little discretion, Alir? Fortunately, their new comrade is trustworthy and offers to take them back to Solm Palace. There's a mission here where you have to defeat some corrupted in the desert. It's peak filler content, but it does introduce two more characters, Pondreo and Bune, who are totally just friends with Fogato. They aren't his retainers, as is the tradition in this game for all royalty to have two retainers. Fogato isn't a prince, and they're just friends. Bune's whole thing is he's a chef, and he probably says things in battle like, I'm gonna chop you up, or I'm gonna cook you up for breakfast. I mean, the material's all there, it's low-hanging fruit. And Pondreo's whole thing is that he's a priest, but he likes to party? Ow, ow, ow! After the filler mission where the corrupted are easily defeated, Fogato takes you back to Solm Palace and introduces you to his mother, the Queen of Solm. But wait, that means... Alir tells Queen Sephoria about Sombron's return and him using the corrupted to take over the world. I don't know if it's the writing or the delivery from her voice actress, but something definitely is left to be desired. Yes, you said. Bell Dragon Sombron's return. I had no idea all that was happening. And he created those creatures, hmm? That explains why they're so vicious. Oh, Satan Incarnate has gained enough power to bring back the dead and destroy all nations? Guess that explains all the zombies in the desert. Well, anyways, do you all want to stay for dinner? So, Sephoria offers to give Alir their nation's emblem ring that they've been keeping in a doodad drawer. This is actually pretty funny and speaks to the Solm people's laid-back nature, especially since Brodia, by contrast, had their emblem ring locked up in a secure place. After no luck finding it, the queen guesses that her daughter, the princess, might have it. She's camping off in the desert somewhere, so Fogato offers to take the party back out to find her. I hope you're hungry for fun, cause that's what's on the menu first! How do you eat fun? Deep in the desert, Princess Tamara is cooking a whole ton of vague meat from... animal? Anyways, she starts singing a song about meat. Meat, meat, meaty meat, meat. And it is just peak Fire Emblem cringe. Fortunately, Tamara's singing is quickly interrupted by two ruffians who threaten to kill her. But in a surprise twist, 
they aren't considered the good guys. I want to also point out the fact that Tamara introduces her two retainers as her backup singers, but then they don't sing or say jack shit when the ruffians threaten her life. What bad friends. They want her emblem ring, naturally, and hey, what do you know, Alir and her friends get there just in time to stop them. Tamara entrusts her ring to the Divine Dragon, who unleashes its power in the form of Ike, the protagonist from Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn. Ike is a big buff boy who can destroy obstacles on the map and help in a lot of other ways too. This level brings back hidden spaces, a staple in most Fire Emblem games. Whether it's fog, or miasma, or in this case darkness, a torch or light magic will be needed to see certain areas of the map. This presents a formidable challenge as you could easily get ambushed by an enemy waiting in the darkness you had no idea was there. I personally really hate these kind of levels, as it's really not a fair fight. I mean, you can't see the enemy, but the enemy can see you just fine. The AI knows where you are, and you can't hide in the dark, so it's just patently unfair. Despite this, this really isn't a hard level, and the two bandits go down easily. You're introduced to Tamara's retainers, Marin and Panet. Marin is basically Princess Mononoke, and Panet is like a creepy Victorian haunted doll. I don't know what her deal is, but I'm probably going to have a nightmare tonight where I wake up and she's at the foot of my bed. Alir explains about Sombron's return, and the Solm Prince and Princess explain that they already know. They go on to say that they've been scouting the areas around their nation's border, hoping to intercept the Divine Dragon so she could unleash their nation's emblem ring and help them defend Solm against further attacks from the Corrupted. Which is a long way of saying they were simply waiting for Alir to come and save their asses from invasion. Tamira reveals that Solm, like Faranay, actually has two emblem rings, the second being located at an oh no, a mid-sentence interruption. You know what that means. It's time for another filler mission. Solm Palace is under attack. Go figure, there's nobody there to defend it. Hortensia has the queen held hostage, which is like, really? There's no guards in the queen's chamber at all? I mean, I get it. The Fire Emblem development team didn't want to make more character models and add them to the scene, but come on. Hortensia is still working with Illusia for some reason, despite Illusia's king being dead. She's still holding a grudge against Ivy after a misunderstanding that her older sister abandoned her during the battle in Brodia. The truth is, things were happening so fast it makes sense that she could see her sister with Alir as a betrayal, even despite everything with her father. Hortensia threatens to kill the queen if Alir doesn't hand over the rings, and Ivy tries to talk her younger sister down. Alir calls Hortensia's bluff, and Ivy and her sister have a heart-to-heart. -heart. Hortensia wants the emblem rings to bring Hyacinth back to life, but Ivy explains the futility of that. Hortensia breaks down crying, which pretty much is your best-case scenario for a hostage negotiation. The situation has been diffused, but only momentarily. Zephia enters, along with Mavier and Marnie, and demands the emblem rings. Zephia uses her vague mind-control sorcery powers to brainwash Hortensia and turn her back against our heroes. I feel like this story beat is a bit redundant, as Hortensia could have literally just been the boss of this level, and then her and Ivy's makeup scene could have happened, but whatever. Now Alir must fight Hortensia and three of the four hounds. It seems a little odd that only two chapters ago, our heroes were running from the four hounds because the former were no match for the latter, and now we're expected to fight and defeat three of them and Hortensia all in one level? It kind of takes the oomph out of that dramatic escape, and as you'll come to discover, from this point forward, you're going to be fighting the Four Hounds a lot. Like, a hundred times. It's crazy. Remember when I joked earlier about the developers not wanting to make models of the Solm Guards for that cutscene? Well, you might believe they ran out of their character budget by the fourth or fifth time in a row that you fight the Hounds. I mean, does Sombron have, like, nobody else working for him? By contrast, the Blazing Blade had tons of different mini-bosses in the form of captains and generals working for the main bad guy. They all had their own personality and ambitions, and you got the sense that there was a much bigger world outside the confines of your group of allies. In Engage, you could easily believe that Sombron only has like four or five friends to do his bidding. Well, that's enough complaining for now. On the brighter side, the music in this map is pretty catchy. We haven't really talked about the music in this game yet, have we? Well, besides the god-awful opening theme, the soundtrack to Engage is actually really stellar. The battle themes are exciting, the Somniel and Overworld areas have a nice, relaxed feel, and the enemy themes are appropriately tense. Everything sounds good, and I've found myself humming certain tracks outside of playing, which is always a positive thing. The Four Hounds theme is this break trap kind of sound, and it's super fast-paced and stresses me out, which I guess is what the composer was going for. The battle theme in Solm, in particular, really captures the feel of Fire Emblem's gameplay well, bringing about a feeling of hope and danger. Overall, another good Fire Emblem soundtrack. After a relatively tough battle, Hortensia is woken from her spell and laments her failure to serve Illusia. Ivy comforts her, telling her that Illusia is lost so long as Sombron is in control. 
and that going back to their home country would just lead to Hortensia becoming a tool to the Dark Lord's end. Ivy convinces her younger sister to fight for the good guys, and she reluctantly agrees, after ashamedly apologizing to the Queen in particular for the mess she made. She hands over a ring that she had stolen from the Hounds, which embodies Byleth, the Professor protagonist from Three Houses. It feels a little strange having a new Fire Emblem game reference Three Houses like it's nostalgic content when it just came out like four years prior, but nevertheless, it's cool to see our brooding emo teacher again. And this time, he talks! And his voice and personality are exactly what I expected him to sound like, which isn't surprising. That actually brings me to another side tangent that I'd like to go down, and that's the issue of Emblem Heroes personalities. In theory, having a game where you get to summon protagonists from previous games is a cool idea. This is the one prop I'll give to Fire Emblem Heroes, a game I despise, but its simple narrative allows that concept to work. In a full-fledged console game, it doesn't really work well for the story. I'll explain. One of the best things about Fire Emblem is the depth and variety of its supporting characters. You've got Sexy Catwoman, you've got Mysterious Black Knights, you've got Romantic Magicians, everything. But the main characters themselves are usually boring, silent RPG protagonists, because it's really about you putting yourself in their shoes. After all, an RPG is a role-playing game. Your RPG protagonists are usually boring by nature, especially if they're surrounded by a cast of loud, colorful characters. This basic idea hasn't really changed much throughout Fire Emblem's long history, so to make a game where 12 of the main characters are just those protagonists? Well, how is that supposed to work? Byleth barely ever said anything in Three Houses. Marth barely said anything because, being from such an old game, there wasn't that much dialogue to begin with. Pretty much half of these emblem heroes have the exact same personality. This is excruciatingly clear when a unit increases their bond with an emblem. You speak with a most unusual dialect, Yunaka. Where did you pick it up exactly? Oh, nowhere. I'm one of a kind. They have got nothing to say to each other. That's because they don't really have much of a personality to begin with. I mean, there are some exceptions to this. Ike, for example, is one of the few non-lords in the Fire Emblem series, and so he comes at things with a different perspective, but even he's just another vague, honorable, silent, blue-haired dreamboat. Now, that wouldn't be such a bad thing if not for the fact that actual new characters had time that could have been spent developing their personalities, wasted on the Emblem heroes instead. Putting so much focus on the Emblem heroes in the main storyline and sidelining all the other recruits really hurts the narrative altogether. Lapis and Citrine could be really interesting characters, but outside of supports, we never know it. Bune and Pendreo seem like they have some stories to tell, but does the main storyline spend any time with them? No, it chooses to spend more time with the gentle, dull, stoic, blue-haired, silent protagonist ghosts instead. I guess the reason I'm bringing this up now is because when Byleth first appears here after being summoned in Solm Palace, I really ought to feel something, especially hot off the heels of Three Houses but he kind of just gets summoned and goes, Hello everyone, I am Byleth. I, I fight for my friends. And then Ike's like, I also fight for my friends. And then Marth's like, I also fight for my friends. And Byleth's like, Okay, great. Well, well that's it for me. Let's keep going to... I, I, I'm going back into the ring. Just, just remember that I fight for my friends. I'll be in the ring. So, like I mentioned earlier, Psalm has two emblem rings, so our party is off towards some ancient ruins deep in the heart of the desert. Tamara jokingly warns that these ruins are known to be haunted, but begins to get apprehensive the closer they get to their destination. I mean, at this point in the story, the dead are openly coming back to life, so I don't know if the word haunted really holds the same weight that it used to, but nevertheless, Tamara has reason to be nervous because the ruins are in fact overrun by the walking dead. A young dancer, Sidal, sometimes goes to the ruins to practice his choreography alone. That night was such a night, and what's the worst thing that could happen to throw off a dancer's practice session? Twisting an ankle? No, being killed by zombies. Fortunately for him, Alir and her party arrive just in time to save him, and to be disappointed that he is, in fact, the only dancer in the game. For those that don't know, the dancer is a rare and elusive class in the Fire Emblem series. A dancer could use their action to restore a spent unit, allowing them to move again. In older games, the dancer was a single person. In later games, a dancer was a class, so there were some options as to who the dancer could be. I guess I got spoiled on the more recent games because I was hoping I'd be able to make someone else my prized dancer. Somebody like Vander, shaking that ancient but toned booty all over the place. To that end, I will master this dance so that I may boogie down at your next party. Huh? 
my back! This level introduces Miasma, which are tile effects that grant negative stats to those standing on them. This, like the darkness tiles a few chapters back, I'm not a fan of. A gimmick for a gimmick's sake is fine with me, but if the gimmick is, let's make the gameplay less fun and really annoying to play, then I'm not interested. Slowly, Alir and her company work their way through the ruins, defeat all the corrupted, and take the emblem ring. This one has Corrin, the protagonist from Fire Emblem Fates in it. Meanwhile, Hortensia's retainers, Rosado and Goldmary, are in the Solm Desert, on the run from Illusion forces. At some point in the last chapter, Hortensia and her two retainers got separated, and it didn't take long for Illusia to turn on the princess once they found out that she's joined Alira's cause. I really love the dialogue for the Illusion soldiers here. Aha! There they are! Let's seize them! Yes, let's. Fortunately, Alir and the company arrive in time to save them, and Hortensia, Rosado, and Goldmary have a happy reunion. The retainers manage to steal an emblem ring from the Illusions, and they hand it over to Alir. This ring houses Erika and Ephraim, the dual protagonists from the Sacred Stones. Their emblem ring is pretty interesting, as it's the only ring to house two different heroes. This makes sense thematically, as Ephraim and Erika are twins, so it makes sense for them to have, like, a shared soul, so to speak. And also, like a lot of the emblem heroes, as I mentioned earlier, they have near non-existent personalities, so, you know, why not cram another dude in there? That's what she said. Yeah. Yeah. Some fans of Ephraim will claim the game did him dirty, and I won't argue against that, but it does allow for an interesting mechanic. You could freely, without using an action, switch between Ephraim and Erica, with each having their own skills and weapon type. Pretty cool. This level's pretty cool too, as parts of the terrain gradually become flooded, blocking your path. It reminds me of a similar level from the Blazing Blade, where toxic liquid would raise and fall in a similar manner. I like this mechanic a lot more than the darkness levels, because at least you could strategize around the map versus getting cheap-shotted by the enemy. So after fighting Mavier and Marnie, again, we cut to a scene with Vale, Gris, and Zephia on a ship to Faranay. Vale is acting strange. She's not the malicious, cold-blooded killer we knew her as in Barodia. Instead, she's this cute, innocent girl that Alir befriended earlier. She's acting like a completely different person, which is odd. Zephy and Gris seem to know that this Vale and the other are two different people. Meanwhile, Alir and her companions stop by Floor Port on the way to Faranay Castle. The port and town are on fire. Zephy and the Illusions had gone there first, and launched an attack to draw out the empathetic Alir. There's a confrontation between both parties, and Alir calls out Vale, and Vale's like, Who, me? I didn't kill anyone, I'm just a little girl. She asks Gris and Zephia if they know anything about the attack on the port, and Zephia finally spills the beans and lays out what the deal is with Vale. As it turns out, Vale is Sombron's daughter, but somehow managed to be pure and doesn't want to destroy the world. This is the Vale Alir befriended earlier. Zephia used her vague dark magic to bring out Vale's dragonic impulses and make her more like the evil dragon lord she ought to be. The spell, however, only partially worked, and so Vale basically developed a case of split personality disorder, with the evil side gradually taking over, but neither side remembering or being aware of the other. Zephia explains all of this in juicy detail, savoring the cruelty in typical supervillain fashion. After her expository speech, evil Vale wakes up and brings back a familiar face, a corrupted version of Hyacinth, but he isn't a mindless zombie like corrupted Morian. Vale apparently had been perfecting her sorcery, and this version of Hyacinth is practically like the original. Ivy is aghast at the idea of having to fight her father, and Illyra is shocked at the cruel game Vale is playing. Which, like, really? You're shocked at that? She's the daughter of the devil. The level is pretty easy, without any specific obstacles. Just your run-of-the-mill kill-everybody map. You fight the four hounds, again. The confrontation with Hyacinth is predictably sad, and your first actual fight with Vale is a little too easy. It does feel good to be able to actually land a blow on her, though, after her invincibility in Chapter 11. Afterwards, she and the four fangs retreat on one of their warships. Vale demands Zephia give her one of the rings, and in a surprise twist, tosses it overboard to Alir. That's like 30 yards away. With an arm like that, Vale should be pitching for the Yankees, damn. When Zephia realizes that the not-evil Veil vale had pulled a fast one on them, she is understandably outraged and slaps the shit out of her. I'll get his head! I'll get his head! Alir is reunited with Sigurd, the protagonist from Genealogy of the Holy War, in one of the more powerful emblems. They consider chasing after the four hounds to rescue not-evil Veil, vale, but decide it's more important to put out the fires in Flora and rescue the survivors first. Despite the sad circumstances, Alir and her friends see a light at the end of the tunnel. They now have the upper hand, with eight emblem rings and only four remaining.
Before the next mission, we're presented with this gem of a scene between Zephia and Sombron. This is actually the first time we've seen any extended dialogue with the Fell Dragon since his introduction in Chapter 10, and boy oh boy. It starts off with your typical bad guy reporting to the even more evil bad guy scene, with the even more evil bad guy talking about how she's failed him, and this is her last chance and don't fail me again, and you've seen all this before. Zephia then mentions that her spell on Vale had been weakening, so Sombron gives her a magic helmet, which will make her go full evil. Stupid plot device aside, if he had that this whole time, why didn't he use that on her already? Keep it safe. Use it when the time is right. Wait, what? Just, just use it on her now. What are you waiting for? There is something else I would like to discuss. What? <laughs> oh my god. You've got to love Sombron's delivery here. The scene then goes from Sombron threatening to kill Zephia because of her repeated failures to please him, to suddenly this incredibly mundane conversation. Pardon me, Lord Sombron, but... Lady Vale is your only child, correct? My only living child? Yes. That is correct. Of course. I was speaking from fear, not fact. Forgive me. Why ask such a thing? Okay, this conversation eventually gets interesting. The long and short of it is, Zephia hints that Alir reminds her of one of his children. Sombron corrects her, saying that he killed the child she was referring to, but Zephia corrects him, saying that no body was ever recovered. Based on context, the child in question is almost certainly our protagonist. This isn't quite a bum 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 moment, because it isn't outright said, but we do know that Alir was injured when fighting Sombron a thousand years ago, so I think it's safe to assume it was her. Also, the main character realizing that they are the child of the enemy is pretty well-worn territory for Fire Emblem. Meanwhile, back in Faranay, our heroes are boarding a ship, courtesy of Queen Eve, and making their way to Illusia. They discuss the challenges they'll face, and whether or not they should believe what they've heard about Vale being two separate people. Alir is naturally conflicted, as she's been hurt the most personally by Vale, and Tamara is the only one with a common sense enough to propose the idea that maybe it's all an act by Vale to trick them. Oh, Tamara, that straightforward thinking doesn't belong in the storyline. Their conversation is cut short when Vander, hey, guess he is still alive, announces that Illusion forces are near and primed to attack their ship. This leads to another familiar staple in Fire Emblem games, the obligatory ship battle map, where you start off on a boat and two other boats are boarding you on either side. As much as I like these maps, I swear I've played them a thousand times. Heavy armor knights closing in on both sides? Check. Flying units coming in from the corner of the map to prevent your escape? Check. A treasure chest off in the corner of one of the ships? Check. Hey, I guess if it's not broken, don't fix it, right? On one of the enemy ships is Linden, a very late in life, late in the game recruit. He's a white magic user, fighting with the illusions, but he's having second thoughts about the direction his country is going. A quick conversation with Alir will easily convince him to change sides. Fire Emblem often has scenarios like these in place to gain new recruits, and I don't doubt that something like this could happen in real life. It's just gotta be really awkward for the remainder of the battle for the new recruit, who has to fight against men who were on his side like five minutes earlier. I can just imagine two of the enemy units being like, uh, hey, why is Linden over there talking to the Divine Dragon instead of fighting her? For that matter, why are we just standing here and letting that happen? Why is he turning around and pointing his magic tomes at us? Bro, what are you doing, bro? We went to Knight's Academy together, bro! I was the best man at your wedding! And now after a 20 second conversation with the enemy, you're suddenly on their side? What the hell? In a surprising twist, the boss of this map isn't one of the Four Hounds, but a random illusion general. This is a welcome change of pace, although it's probably one of, like, three times in the entire game where this happens. Whatever, I'll take it. After the illusion forces are defeated, we get treated to the scene between the Four Hounds, where Gris is practically salivating at the idea of getting punished. So he's gonna punish us, right? Finally, yes. Just want to remind everybody that this game is rated T for Teen. Zephia shows off her fancy new magic helmet that will wipe out the persona of the innocent Vale. Mavier and Marnie are tasked with going after Alir, and Mavier, apparently having some fondness for the innocent Vale, asks that Zephia wait to use the helmet until after he's returned. Zephia promises, but come on, does this look like a trustworthy person? She's wearing a choker. A choker! Alir and her companions make it to give her a port in Illusia, noting that they manage to stroll right in without confrontation. Ivy is naturally suspicious of some sort of a trap or ambush, but despite the inherent danger, our party has no choice but to press forward. Alir sees what she thinks is an illusion citizen nearby and goes to say hello, but surprise, it's a corrupted. 
Okay, how long have you been fighting these zombies, Alir? You really thought that that was just some regular guy? Anyway, Alir and Ivy suggest moving forward, but the rest of the party opposes, saying that they ought to help out the survivors. The Divine Dragon points out that sadly, there likely aren't any survivors to save. Diamant is baffled at the idea that Sombron would bring devastation to Illusia as well, but that's pretty much typical evil villain stuff. Use an ally for what they're worth and then discard them. Before our heroes could press on, they're stopped by Mavier and Marnie, who threaten to kill them if they don't hand over the Emblem Rings. A threat that holds, like, no weight at all because they've already been defeated like ten times already. Alir asks if Vale is still safe, and Mavier shows a little too much of his hand here, sharing sympathy over Vale's well-being, to Marnie's frustration. She taunts the group some more, and the level begins. I feel like the difficulty spikes pretty heavily around this part of the game. The stage is full of miasma, which gives an advantage to the corrupted and a disadvantage to the player. They make a strange point of showing off a flame cannon nearby that could cut through the miasma, but it literally could only reach a very short area of the map. On top of that, standing in fire is absolutely not preferable to standing in a poison mist, so what the heck was the point of putting this cannon here at all for? The port is laid out in a grid pattern, making any strategy around siphoning your enemy pretty difficult. That, mixed with the enemy units having an especially high defense and resistance, make it one of the hardest levels I've played so far. Sometimes in Fire Emblem games, it's best to just stick to the objective. I tried a few different strategies, including keeping my distance, but Mavier has a warp wand that allows him to send enemies across the board closer to my units. Pretty good move, I'll admit. Eventually, I won this map by just cutting straight through the corrupted horde and taking out Mavier and Marnie as fast as I could. You'll also meet Saphir, a royal knight from Brodia who was sent to aid Alir at her quest. She's a stout old broad, and her heavy defense make this level a whole lot easier. After their defeat, Mavier shares with Alir that Zephia is planning on using her magic helmet on Vale to eliminate the good side and allow the evil side to take over completely. Alir sees that the stoic knight empathizes with the innocent Vale and wants to protect her. He leaves, realizing that he said too much, and Marnie chases after him. Alfred has some reservations about letting them go, but Alir thinks Mavier will still have an important role to play. Mavier and Marnie lost their two emblem rings, Roy and Mykia, and Zephia is not happy about it. Marnie. Yes? How can you snap? How can you snap? I know I used that clip already, but I couldn't help myself. She punishes the hounds by attacking them with some sort of fire magic. This somehow doesn't kill them though, just knocks them out. Which I guess is convenient for the plot, but how do you light somebody on fire and not kill them? Alir and company make their return to Illusia Castle. The Divine Dragon has a lot of self-doubt since their last defeat here, but Alfred encourages her, telling her that they've only learned and gotten stronger since. Ivy mentions how strange it is that the castle is completely empty, not a guard in sight. Okay, now I am convinced that this is a budget thing. I mean, come on guys, even if you had just one model of a guard and then copy-pasted a hundred times, I would have been happy with that at least. Anyways, Grish shows up to confront the party, flaunting the pilfered Celica ring. The ring of the caring princess! It's the real deal, too. <laughs> I don't know why that line always makes me crack up. It's just such a placid name for a spirit that's essentially being used as a weapon of mass destruction. Give me back the all-powerful ring of the polite young lady! Also, man, Chris is one dirty boy, especially in this conversation. What is this about? You want answers. You'll have to whack them out of me. So the battle begins with Mr. Dirty Boy teleporting away and cutting the lights to the castle. Suddenly we've entered a dangerous game of cat and mouse, and at any time, Gris can pop out of the shadows and one-hit kill your units. Surprise, motherfucker! It certainly isn't the easiest battle, but torches and illumination for magic users goes a long way here. After the battle, Gris drops a bombshell on Alir, telling her that she's not Lumera's daughter, but the Fell Dragons. Alir a little too readily believes this, and has her Empire Strikes Back moment. Gris leaves after buying enough time for Vale and the other hounds to leave Illusia Castle. Alir then borrows from Return of the Jedi, and asks confirmation of her parentage from a Blue Force ghost. A certain point of view? The party encourages Alir though, basically saying that regardless of her parentage, she's still the Divine Dragon. We don't get to choose where we come from, but we do get to choose which path we take. As Alir expresses gratitude for her support of friends, Mavier enters. He explains that he isn't here to fight, and suggests a temporary truce. He wants to reunite Alir with her sibling, in an effort to help out Vale. Alir agrees to this, and the party heads back to Lethos. They meet up with Marnie, who is not very happy about their temporary truce, and is suspicious about Mavier helping the enemy. 
On the ride to Lethos, Mavier explains that Sombron is trying to resurrect the continent of Gradlon, home of the Fell Dragon, that sank to the bottom of the ocean years earlier. In fact, his greater plan is to not just rule the world, but rule all other worlds as well, possibly meaning the worlds of the Emblem Heroes. Mavier then also goes on to explain a bit about Vale's history. She had several siblings, but they all died in a war millennia ago, save for Alir. After Sombron was captured, Vale had to go into hiding, being the daughter of the enemy and all. She lived in hiding for a thousand years, with no family to call her own. When Sombron was freed, he detested her, as she lacked the ability to summon emblems. Sombron then used Zephia to put a spell on his daughter, to brainwash her into submission. Alir is brought to tears over Vale's sad life, but surprisingly, so is Marnie, who up until that point had only shown us uncaring narcissism. Marnie then opens up, giving the player an equally sad story about how she was abandoned by her mother as a child, and was brought in by Zephia, a mother figure who at least praised her once in a while. Mavier explains that his loyalty is to Vale, and that he expects to be kicked out of the Hounds once they arrive in Lethos. Marnie is conflicted, and ultimately decides not to join him, though the offer was only loosely suggested anyways. When the party arrives in Lethos, it's looking a lot like Pride Rock after the Hyenas took over. Alir enters Lethos Castle, immediately facing Zephia and Gris after going through zero guards. Zephia is incensed at Mavier's betrayal, and he doesn't make any excuses. He defends Marnie, however, insisting that she had nothing to do with this. That's when Vale shows up and agrees to speak to Alir. Since we last saw Vale, she's apparently hit up the local Hot Topic and has gone full Spider-Man 3. Find us some shade. The evil veil has completely taken over, thanks to Zephia's magic helmet. Marnie starts to have a real identity crisis here, realizing that Vale's sad life has effectively been snuffed out due to Zephia's meddling. She puts her foot down, explaining that she loves the hounds, but can't tolerate this cruelty any longer. She goes to break the magic helmet, but evil Vale's magic aura is too tough to penetrate. Angered by Marnie's betrayal, Zephia straight up prison shanks her, which somehow is more lethal than burning her alive like she did earlier. Marnie dies, and it's really sad. It's actually quite impressive how much of a 180 her character does near the end of the game, and it'll make a replay of the story that much more interesting. Don't feel too bad for Marnie though, she'll go on to live a happy afterlife, haunting and vaguely flirting with her granddaughter. Mavier shows some rare emotion, Marnie being the only other person besides Vale that he seemed to care about. Angered, he finally turns his back on the hounds and joins Alir. This leads to a battle where you once again have to fight Zephia, Gris, and Vale, although this time it feels a little more thematically appropriate. Well, at least we won't have to fight Marnie again. <laughs> uh. After the battle, the spell on Vale is broken, Alir apparently dealing a strong enough blow to the helmet to bring back the good Vale temporarily. I will not allow it. <laughs> uh, excuse me, I'm trying to narrate here. What? I said I'm trying to narrate. I will not allow it. Okay, now you're just trolling me. Sombron has turned himself into a big snack. Rather than tricking him into becoming a genie, which I feel like is the obvious choice, Vale instead simply defies the evil wishes of her father. He uses magic breath to land a blow on her, but Alir heroically takes the damage for her. Alir has tearful final words for her sister, a sad moment, though a bit redundant for the player, knowing they obviously aren't going to kill off the main character. This isn't Game of Thrones. Vale has an emotional breakdown, and Sombron evilly gloats over her misfortune. He now has all 12 emblem rings, and it's an even more dramatic, all is lost moment than Chapter 11 was. He uses the emblem rings to become infinitely more powerful, growing in size and busting free from Lethos Castle. He flies off and uses his power to rise Gradlon out of the ocean. To make matters worse, Evil Vale takes back over, Zephy and Gris are somehow still not dead, and they call forth some more corrupted soldiers. Our heroes are thoroughly outmatched now. The scene then abruptly flashes back to a thousand years ago, with Alir fighting Sombron for the first time. She kills him, but before she could have a happy ending, is suddenly struck through the heart. And you're to blame. We get treated to another Alir death scene, which has virtually no emotional impact because we just saw the same thing happen 30 seconds earlier. The dialogue here is not great. But I wanted to be a good dragon. In the present, Alir wakes up in some sort of Black Panther afterlife. She meets the Good Vale, who is effectively dead too. They commiserate over their circumstances, but before giving up entirely, Alir suggests to her sister that they use her fell dragon magic to revive herself as a corrupted. Vale isn't crazy about the idea of turning her sister into a mindless zombie, but agrees to it anyways. In the real world, Vale starts to fight back against evil Vale, and finally takes back her body, vanquishing her evil side for good. Mavier, in particular, is amazed at her strength of will. 
My sister helped me. The Divine Dragon? No, her other sister. Idiot. Vale then uses her fell dragon powers to bring Alir back to life, to the shock of everyone else. They aren't feeling great about the Divine One being a zombie, but Alir convinces them that she's the same person they all knew before. This leads to a new chapter, where you have to regather all the emblem rings that have been scattered and left behind by the bad guys before Sombron left. Why exactly did Sombron leave all the emblem rings behind after working the whole game to attain them? Well, I guess he thought that Alir was dead and thus couldn't use them anymore, but still, it's a little silly. It'd be like if after the stormtroopers burned down Luke's home, thinking he was inside and dead, they just go, hey, here would be a great place to leave the Death Star blueprints. He won't be able to use them to stop us. He's dead. So of course, right here is the best place for them. You're sure he's dead, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Luke is one of the two skeletons, right? Wasn't there three people living in this house? Why don't we just take these blueprints with us? Why do we even need to leave them at all? Stop asking questions, Ted. In this map, the goal is to get to each Emblem Ring location and grab them while avoiding an onslaught from the nearby Corrupted. A cool detail is that each unit has a custom dialogue for when they snatch up a ring. Afterwards, Alir's reunion is sadly cut short. Alir uses all of her energy to summon the emblems, and her body starts to wither away. Alir gives another dying speech and then fades away. She's saddened that she didn't get to see things through to the end, but just like I said before, this isn't Game of Thrones. She'll be fine. The Emblem Spirits take pity on her and use their powers to bring her back to life. When she's revived, she loses the red from her eyes and hair, discarding her fell dragon blood and becoming fully divine. Marth tells her that Lumera prepared a ring for her, knowing that someday she would need to be resurrected in Emblem form. Alir is now the 13th Emblem, the Fire Emblem. Get it, guys? The other emblems reveal that this deus ex machina is a one-time thing, and nobody should expect them to resurrect anybody else ever again. Which is, you know, pretty convenient. The others express their happiness about Alir's return, and finally reunited, the party sets out to Gradlon to try to stop the fell dragon for good. This is about the point in my video where I mentioned that I have a Patreon, and you can find the link in the video's description. My videos, but especially videos like these, take a lot of time and effort to make. Your donations allow me some financial wiggle room, which in turn allow me to spend more time and attention on future projects. Any donation at all is greatly appreciated, and helps me fund more videos like this one. If you like this video but can't donate, please still subscribe to my channel, leave a comment, and give a thumbs up. This drives engagement to my channel, and helps let me know you want to see more content like this. With all that out of the way, let's get back into it. Alir and company arrive in the volcanic land of Gradlon, where, to nobody's surprise, they immediately run into Zephia and Gris. Vale tries one last time to convince them to change sides, but the two hounds are too stubborn to budge. Vale makes peace with the fact that they're going to fight them to the death, which, come on. I know we've fought you guys like 20 times already, but this time, it's to the death. I think they'll be fine. The goal of this map is to reach this magical shard that Gris and Zephia are protecting. The shard is creating a magical barrier around Gradlon, so naturally it needs to be destroyed. They'll use the power of the shard to fling meteors at your party, a considerable obstacle, but it's certainly not the hardest challenge in the game. Being a masochist, Gris is super excited to die, and Zephia has a pretty interesting exchange here with Mavier if you were to use him in the fight. Another fun thing about Fire Emblem games, since I haven't mentioned it yet, is that often boss fights will have unique conversations depending on who's being used in the battle. It's often most satisfying to use a character who knows the boss because that adds emotional stakes to the battle. In The Blazing Blade, for example, the boss, Sonya, will have a unique conversation if you're using her daughter, Nino. It's not always easy to see these conversations because that specific character you chose might not be the strongest match for the boss, but it's just so satisfying when your unit does manage to win. Likewise in Engage, defeating Zephia with Mavier specifically feels the most thematically appropriate. After Zephia's defeat, hey, what do you know, it actually was for the last time, Alir and her party destroy the shard. Before Zephia dies, she tells them that there's one more shard to destroy, and the other one is at the bottom of the lake. She offers up her magic staff, which naturally has the power to drain lakes. Which, I mean, what are the odds, right? Vale questions Zephia's motives, but Zephia simply states that she's feeling generous since she's dying anyways. The party leaves, and we see a conversation between Zephia and Gris, who's still alive, but just barely. She explains that she helped them to get back at Lord Somberon. 
Zephia says that she truly did see the Four Hounds as a family, and laments their dissolution. Grish shows some unexpected character growth by telling Zephia that he considered her family too. The dynamic of these characters very suddenly change, and we're hit with an insanely depressing scene of these two realizing, only in death, that they could have been happy in their lives if they had just made different choices. Oh my god, they're holding hands. I'm gonna lose it. Alir and company make it to the lake Zephia described. Vale mentions that Zephia's magic lake-draining amulet will only work for a few hours, which... how could she possibly know that? She uses the amulet to either drain the lake or raise the mountains. Either way, we're not going to show it because we used up all of our animation budget. In the commotion, Alir somehow gets separated from the rest of the party. She comes across a strange sight. It's herself, but like a bizarro, evil version of herself that is serving Sombron. Alir speculates that the amulet must have worked, by sending her back in time to a point where the lake didn't exist yet, and she could reach the amulet, which would also explain her running into her past self. A time-traveling plotline thrown in at the very end of the game, really? That's... odd. Pastelier explains that she needs to collect the emblem rings to please her father, who will kill more of her siblings if they don't prove themselves worthy. Regular Alir leaves to go find her friends, and Pastelier watches her go, commenting to herself that she'll have to stop them eventually. Alir reunites with the others, and also past Zephia, who at this point is still thoroughly evil. Oh no, does that mean we have to fight the Four Hounds again, but in the past? Please say no. Fortunately, Zephia leaves, but unfortunately, she's gone off to tell Sombron what they're up to. Our heroes need to stop Zephia, but they need to get past, past Alir, first. During the stage, past Alir will use her magic to summon avalanches and slow your party down. It's a pain, but the real pain is fighting yourself. Past Alir is a strong foe, and she has an evil version of Marth to help out too. When she's defeated, she laments that Sombron will likely kill her now. Once Alir destroys the second shard, the party is teleported back to the present, because it's convenient to the plot. Meanwhile, we get treated to another classic Sombron and Zephia mess around, where the Dark Lord basically explains the true meaning of family. Family is function and utility. You put blood in, you get loyalty out. And then this happens. I would like to make one of these children with you. Sombron says he's got no time for dad ass. He's got evil stuff to do. Zephia considers how having a child could make her happy, but of course, we know that never ends up happening. Before going to the future, we get one more scene with Lumera meeting an injured past Alir. Why Lumera is wandering around the wastelands of Gradlon is anybody's guess. She shows past Alir kindness. But when Alir learns who she is, she tells the Divine Dragon she'll need to kill her. Lumera talks her out of it, and we begin to see the start of their mother-daughter relationship. In the future, Alir and her party head towards their final destination, Gradlon Temple. Bale seems to know where exactly the last shard is, but doesn't tell the others, harboring some dark secret. She insists on going into the temple alone, and when she's pressed on why, we soon find out. A corrupted version of Lumera appears, acting very close to the original. This really bums Alir out, knowing that she'll have to fight her mother to the death. Vale apologizes, knowing previously that Sombron had done this, and offers to face her alone, but Alir insists on doing the deed herself. But before the group could go inside, they find that Vale has already snuck in and locked the door, preventing Alir the pain of having to face Lumera. Corrupted Lumera taunts Vale, reminding her that it was her that killed Lumera originally. Vale takes responsibility for this, but attacks the corrupted Lumera all the same. Her attacks do nothing, as Lumera has a MAGIC SHIELD! Thanks to Lord Sombron's largesse, I am far more powerful now than I was before. What the hell is a large ass? Alir breaks into the temple, and Lumera switches back from malicious to sentimental. She talks earnestly about how during the war, all her friends and family died, and she was very lonely. Meeting and bonding with Alir, another broken soul, was one of the best things that ever happened to either of them. She asks Alir to ally with her, but Alir knows that, while there is a bit of Lumera's memories and whatnot in this corrupted form, it is ultimately a trick from Sombron, and that the real Lumera is long gone. Realizing that she won't be able to trick Alir, Lumera goes into straight-up mother-in-law mode. Poisoned you against me. The emblems? The stewards? That sister of yours? The battle begins, and the corrupted Lumera turns out to be a pretty formidable foe. One cool thing I didn't mention earlier is that since Alir is an emblem now, she gains a new ability which allows her to pair up with other units, much like the unison attacks from Awakening. So basically, she gets to be played as a unit and as an emblem simultaneously. With this new attack, Lumera is done for. Afterwards, the corrupted part of Lumera fades away, long enough to have a genuine reunion with her daughter one last time. 
She marvels at the fact that Alir is an emblem now, and the two have a heartfelt chat about how they are appreciative that they got to know each other in life. Lumera disappears, for good this time. The party destroys the last shard, and goes outside the temple to see a giant, ominous portal in the sky. Everyone knows that this will be their final battle. They contemplate a better world without the Fell Dragon, and how they must fight to make that a reality. The emblems use their magic to move the Somniel closer to the portal, and this will be your last chance in the game to explore the sanctuary and equip your units with everything they need for their final battle. Shortly after, Marth confides something with our protagonist. He explains that since Sombron opened the portal, it has disrupted the reality of their world and thus the connection between the emblem heroes and the world. Once the portal is closed again, it will further disrupt that connection and sever it completely. The emblem heroes will effectively fade out of existence. Alira is saddened to hear this, but Marth and her both agree that the fate of the world is far more important. At the portal between worlds, Alira faces Sombron, who's been waiting for a proper fight. He offers them one last opportunity to run, but of course, our heroes reject it, telling him that they'll stop him from invading other worlds. He corrects them, saying he doesn't wish to just invade, but to reunite with the Zero Emblem. Sombron drops the bombshell that he isn't even of this world, and that his own world was destroyed in a war over the pursuit of the emblems. The enemy that slaughtered Sombron's family exiled him to Elios, but unbeknownst to him, he stole one of the emblem rings, known as the Zero Emblem. The Zero Emblem was a ruthless, merciless thing, and abandoned Sombron. This led the fell dragon down his dark path of cruelty and using people as pawns. Sombron found some virtue in fighting alone, which of course thematically pits him against our heroes who have learned to fight as a team. Sombron strategically closes the portal he created, cutting the invisible tether that emblems have to this world. They disappear, leaving the heroes to fend for themselves. Before Sombron can escape to the other side of the portal, our heroes gear up for their final battle to stop him. When the level begins, all your units will get their own unique dialogue, much like in previous Fire Emblem games. It's always a nice touch that makes your journey with your specific units seem to matter more. Despite the portal being cut off, Alir is able to summon the emblems one last time. We get to see a montage of each emblem, which kind of reminds me a little bit of an 80s sitcom intro. Sombron scoffs at their effort, and Alir retorts with a really long, corny speech about the power of friendship. It's cheesy and terrible, and exactly what I signed up for, and it'll make the final boss's inevitable defeat thoroughly satisfying. The battle begins with a pretty straightforward stage where you fight Sombron and a handful of Corrupted. After his first defeat, Sombron goes into his second form, the Giant Demonic Serpent. He also summons reinforcements, which take on the form of the villains from the previous Fire Emblem games. This could have been a real epic moment, and it's a cool idea, but they literally just take generic, corrupted form with only the names to indicate who they're supposed to be. The fact that they would tease this idea but not actually use any of the actual villain's, like, character models, it's a real slap to the balls. Alir and her friends defeat the corrupted and take down Fel Sombron. The Fel Dragon then goes on to give a surprisingly sad death speech, talking about how he'll never get to return home now, and he'll never be reunited with the emblem that abandoned him. He'd been looking for him all along, and despite extolling the virtues of independence, really just wanted the approval of the person he had always looked up to. Elir asked why he couldn't just bond with her or her siblings, and Sombron essentially slaps her outstretched hand away, scorning any last goodwill they had. He laments that he'll die alone in a foreign land. Elir suggests that he try to summon the Zero Emblem one last time. Sombron does, and is surprised to find that it actually worked. Nobody sees the emblem, and maybe the emblem never appeared and it was just in Sombron's dying imagination, but either way, he gets some solace right before death. Now that the war is over and the portal is closed, our heroes need to say their final goodbyes to the emblems, whose power is fading, and they gradually cease to exist. We get another montage of the emblems, with each character saying something noble and heroic as they fade away, except for Ephraim, who's like, wait, what's happening to me? Just kidding, the game didn't even bother to show him at all. Screw him, apparently. As the game winds to a close, we get some closure on each unit. I won't go into what happens with each character, that's something you could look forward to when you beat the game yourself. The final scene takes place in the Ring Chamber. It's Alira's coronation day, where she'll become the Divine Dragon officially. She's sad that the Emblem Heroes won't be there to see it, but is grateful for the time they had together, especially with Marth. Her friends come in to make sure she's ready for her big day, and they all run off merrily together. After she's gone, there's a vague idea floated that the Emblem Rings may be able to be summoned again, despite the fact that this explicitly contradicts everything the game's been saying for the last hour. Still, it's nice to think that some things really aren't absolute, that the bonds we make in life can endure forever, at least in spirit, long after they're done and gone. The 
Engage is definitely a game that plays it safe. That's not necessarily a bad thing, it just means that things could be a bit predictable. The story opens in a flash forward to the final battle. The heroes are fighting a mysterious cultist who's trying to resurrect an ancient evil dragon, and after things go terribly wrong, we're taken back to the beginning of the story where our amnesiac protagonist is awoken by a gang of friendly guardians, namely a spunky young girl, an older, mild-mannered knight, and more. Then later, your mother figure is tragically murdered, and then very late in the game, against all thematic rationality, you're able to recruit your mother's murderer into your party as an ally. If this sounds exactly like Fire Emblem Awakening, you'd be right. It is exactly like Fire Emblem Awakening. Engage plays it safe by modeling itself off a previously successful title. Weirdly enough, Awakening already was the playing it safe title. When Awakening was originally being made, the developers were under the impression that this would be the very last Fire Emblem game. The series had been rapidly declining in popularity, and so Awakening was Fire Emblem's swan song, its final performance. As such, it also dipped heavily into nostalgia and played it safe in a lot of ways. Notably, Marth, or the idea of Marth, the main character from the first Fire Emblem, was a heavy focus on Awakening's story. In Engage, guess who's back? I don't know. The impact of Marth's nostalgic cameo is kind of lessened considering Awakening only came out 10 years ago? Oh, excuse me while I go have a midlife crisis in the corner. Nevertheless, there haven't been a ton of Fire Emblem games that have come out between Awakening and Engage, so to use Awakening as a format is kind of like, I don't know, going to Hawaii for your 10-year wedding anniversary, and it's super special and you've never been before, and then on your 13th wedding anniversary, going back to Hawaii. It just seems too early to be retracing those steps. It'd be like if they rebooted Spider-Man three times in the course of 15 years. Conversely, one of the things that made Three Houses so special was that it was a completely new story. It didn't rely on nostalgia, and thus it was able to create a rich and deep world that made it stand out among the other Fire Emblem games. Some other themes in Engage that are reused, Anna's entire persona, the Black Fang, whoops, I mean the Four Hounds, potentially incestuous twin brother ruffian bosses that finish each other's sandwiches. No. A brooding goth girl dark magic user who wears laundry into battle and everyone just acts like that's totally normal. A tall, tan-skinned, silver-haired, erotic, maleficent-esque magic user, and second-in-command villainess with a weird hat and a penchant for cruelty. And a demonic resurrected dragon that is evil purely for the sake of attaining power, final boss. But that one's a given for the franchise. I don't think the nostalgia angle necessarily hurt the game. The Emblem Heroes are a cool feature, it's just that the developers obviously saw it as a way to justify half-assing the storyline. And I don't necessarily blame them. This game likely was in production not long after Three Houses, and probably got delayed for a while due to 2020's COVID pandemic. This means the developers were probably really creatively burnt out, and didn't want to make a Three Houses epic scale game again, when it would be easier to just use Three Houses as their template, bring in nostalgia bait, and then add in a story later. That's all speculation on my end, and maybe they really did try with a story, but I don't know. I feel like if this game would have had another year or two, we could have had the polished gameplay and an engaging story. Hey, I made a pun. Sort of. I've been thinking a lot about my hopes for the future of Fire Emblem. I think overall, while Engage definitely makes some missteps, it is a leap forward for the franchise. I do miss the personal touch of romancing units together. Even if you're not into the dating sim stuff, it still adds depth to the characters and it makes you care more about them. Obviously, a story more on par with the epicness of Three Houses would help a lot. Obviously, I'm not the first person to talk about the flimsy aspects of Engage's storyline and how that hindered it from being a stellar game. I would also like to see these games take a little more risk. Fates broke the game into two halves, a la Pokemon titles, well with the red and the blue and all that. This made things a bit more interesting because to get the whole picture required some effort. Three Houses threw out the conventional skill and class system and made leveling up a whole different process, and in my opinion, a way more satisfying and customizable way of playing. I want Fire Emblem to keep swinging for the fence. No more playing it safe with reunions, anniversaries, and Marth cameos. No more mobile gacha games where you pay actual money to unlock deviant art of characters progressively losing their clothing. Instead, I hope the franchise really spends time developing thought-provoking, emotional stories with deep characters and heavily customizable gameplay that gets better and better. As we've come to see, all the pieces are there in previous games, and gameplay-wise, Engage is the final piece of the puzzle. The developers have everything they need to make a perfect Fire Emblem game, so I'm going to hold them to that standard moving forward, and I genuinely believe the future will be bright for the franchise. Engage made me feel something that I haven't felt in a very long time. Genuine fun playing a video game. The older I get, the more discerning I have to be with how I spend my time. I have a young son now, and truthfully, all I really have time to play are games that I'd want to share with him when he's old enough, and Fire Emblem Engage, I think, 
is a game I could return to in the future and play with my son. I'll look at him with a proud smile and a twinkle in my eye and say, Why are you making Yunaka a Pegasus Rider? She has terrible magic stats. Are you insane? Did your mother put you up to this? Are you even using the Bond Rings? What do you mean you haven't adopted any cats yet? Don't you want them to catch fish for you? How else do you think you're going to get fish? Before you go, I've got a question for you. What would you want to see in a future Fire Emblem game? A return to 8-bit character art? A complete change of the battle system? An Ana multiverse game where every character, including the enemy units, are all Anas? Or maybe something else? Let me know in the comments. Well, thanks for sticking it out for this very long video. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. I try my best to respond to every comment, so if you want to keep the conversation going, let's keep it going. Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next video.